Day featuring um, Hans Lamkin, Ryan Aga, and Don Brock from the Health Partners Institute Clinical Simulation Center. We're so excited to hear you guys present today. And so without further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Ryan. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Abby, and thanks to the entire Park Nicollet Foundation leadership team for this opportunity. I'm greatly privileged and honored to share um, this time with you this morning. Hopefully you've all uh, poured yourself uh, some good coffee, and um, I love the words of coffee plus chat because I'm a huge coffee addict. So um, so thank you all, and um, it's my pleasure uh, to, to join and share our immense work uh, with, with all of you. Um, uh, my name is Ryan Aga. I am the uh, system-wide uh, director of clinical simulation for health partners. Um, I am a nurse by background, so I uh, spent 21 years in emergency medicine. Uh, 17 of those 21 years were at Regions Hospital, a level one pediatric and adult trauma center. Um, and uh, really went up throughout the ranks um, as an emergency nurse, ending my career as the nurse manager with oversight of around 300 people in the emergency department. Um, since that time, I've transitioned uh, my career. Um, I always call it kind of a midway transition throughout my, uh, my career in healthcare. And now I've landed um, in healthcare simulation. And I, I, I say this to everyone that I, um, I come around that I've literally found my jam. I um, love healthcare simulation. It has so much purpose um, and impact. And we'll get further into why it has such purpose and impact uh, throughout today's presentation. Uh, but without a further ado, I want to hand it over to my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, hand it over to Don Brock so he can introduce himself. And then after that, Hans Lamb can, can introduce himself. It's good morning. Uh, and yes, thank you for extending this invitation for us to talk about ourselves, which uh, we do a lot of, which is great. But um, well, Hans might disagree with that, but Ryan and I talk about us all the time, our simulation platform. Uh, my background is primarily uh, critical care, trauma, flight, ER medicine, you know, from the nursing perspective. I've been a nurse for over 25 years. I have uh, retired Air Force, U.S. Air Force, uh, retired from that in 2015 um, as the director of critical care flight operations for uh, our program out at uh, Fort Snelling. And, and on the civilian side, I've worked a variety of, of, of fields to include uh, education, training, ER medicine, uh, flight nursing, and group for life wing for a while. Um, and then really landed in the world of simulation a couple of years ago, um, kind of out of desperation after uh, after COVID, being in the ER and COVID, kind of, I don't, I don't think Shane and listen say that kind of wrecked me, but I looked for a different lane. I was thinking about retirement, and uh, Ryan and and Hans snagged me away from that, and I landed in this wonderful position called the operations manager for the Health Partners Institute Clinical Simulation Program, and I'm having a blast. I love this job. I love these people. I love the mission. Um, I love the connections that we make, and you know we continuously have opportunities like this to share our platform and what we're doing. I'm very proud of this team. We have there's 15 of us on this team now. When Ryan took this program over four years ago, there were four people, and now we have 15. We're going to continue to grow and continue to infuse ourselves. And as Ryan, you know, um, goes through the balance of this PowerPoint presentation, you'll understand and appreciate why. So, but again, thank you for uh, our having us here this morning. I'm gonna pass the baton to our good friend, Hans. Good morning, everybody. Hans Lampkin, uh, Simulation Operations Specialist with the Simulation Center. I've been with Health Partners Simulation for almost 14 years now. My background is primarily EMS. I uh, worked on the ambulance for 20 years as a couple different roles with uh, as a rescue captain, working, uh, doing extrication, rescue diver, water rescue, rope rescue, all those uh, different aspects. So um, with uh, with the team here, um, uh, you know, it, we work with a lot of different um, institutions, hospitals, uh, all over the Midwest um, with partnering with different uh, uh, different organizations with our team. So, but uh, yes, yeah, so thanks for having me here in the morning. Thanks, Hans. All right, uh, crew and greater audience. Number one, I can't see you, which um, does bug me with Microsoft Teams. So I'm speaking into the abyss here, but um, I am such a 
I love seeing people's facial reactions. So Abby and Ivy, just please stop me and facilitate the chat um, as, as it comes in. Please um, ask a lot of questions, folks, um, because this is probably one of the most important areas of healthcare um, that we need to, what, when I came into it, need to democratize. We need simulation in every single nook and cranny of healthcare now more than ever. And we'll get into that a little bit later, why it's now now more than ever. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick, quick glimpse um, of three segments here. What is clinical simulation? And I will say you're probably closest to simulation of the greater public um, when you go to the international airports. When you aboard an aircraft, that's when you know that those people on those planes have simulated. They've simulated way more hours than they are in the cabin or the cockpit. Um, and so in, in healthcare simulation, we are still very early on with democratizing healthcare simulation. Um, it's somewhat sad because just think of how saturated we are and what, what is more important than the human, the lives of human beings. And so, um, so simulation uh, is a dynamic training method. It replicates real healthcare scenarios that enhance clinical skills and decision making. So we recreate reality. It's not an e-learning or a module that the clinicians just click through and have no experiential hands-on tools um, to face clinical problems. Um, the e-learning is just click, it's done, and then they go see patients and provide practice. What simulation does is it it's a hands-on experiential learning process. And we'll get a, a little bit further into the 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 what is clinical simulation in the next couple bullets here. Probably the most important that it's a safe, brave space for learning. We pride ourselves and build ourselves on a container of safety and brave bravery uh, based on a psychologically safe space. And so we promote failure in simulation. Actually, we want people to fail in sim because it's it's simulation. It's not reality. It's not human beings in front of us. And so um, we promote that safe, brave space for learning and failure because we want to achieve that we are the most safest when our clinicians leave our spaces, that they provide the safest care that's possible. So it provides a controlled setting for practices, improving communication among, amongst healthcare professionals. And we know that communication failure is the biggest failure in healthcare. We don't communicate uh, effectively. We've trained in silos, nursing, physicians, security, respiratory therapy. What simulation is, it's a convening space where we can bring interprofessional collaboration into this safe, brave learning space and perform experiential um, simulation training across disciplines. When people come into simulation, I kind of call it a, a sacred hallowed space where peop, the, the outcomes of simulation um, and the dialogue that happens when we convene all of these people together for uh, outcomes of the learning, it is immense, the learning that takes place in simulation. Because we're all together, we're all sharing each other's um, vulnerabilities amongst each other because we know that it's safe and it's brave. Um, so the 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 safety and bravery of simulation is a, a, a gold standard and a hallmark and a driving force to what we do uh, on our day to day. You're going to learn and see a bunch of simulation equipment and modalities in the next several slides. But what is utmost importance to simulation is in one thing. It's improved patient outcomes and saving the lives of human beings. Simulation modalities that we have essentially in our toolkit or our tool chest um, are emerging. Uh, technology is throwing us into a sphere that we're all learning, um, and that's called mixed uh, virtual reality avatars, uh, virtual wall environments. I think I see Fernando on this 
meeting who um, comes globally um, throughout the world on immersive wall environments. Um, the other segment um, on the left side of the screen is human simulation. This is where we provide actors or standardized patients or standardized embedded actors into simulation. We recreate simulation environments where it's acted out with human beings. Um, I'll give a quick example. Um, I'm a new physician, say I'm a new physician, and I literally have no idea how to say to the patient or the family member across the, the, the room here that their five-year-old just died in a motor vehicle accident. What we can do is create that situation in simulation through human simulation and that narrative and dialogue based on um, an objective. And so I can fail here. I can just botch it up and it's okay. And I learned from exemplars in the industry that have learned and lived those experiences. And I can learn from them in simulation before I go out into the real world and botch it up. And then I look back at myself as a failure. So human simulation evokes um, experiential simulation learning with human beings. The other modality um, that is probably one of the most maturest along with human simulation is mannequin task-based simulation. So this middle um, is a photo that we did with the United States Air Force um, in our training with them. It's a mannequin. It can bleed, it can vomit, it can make noises, we can intubate, we can do a crack its chest and do a thoracotomy, we can ultrasound that mannequin. Um, that's task-based simulation. And what we do is bring interprofessional teams around that simulator that we can change the physiologic outcomes in that simulator so that the participants that are faced with that can make their change their um, approach to treating whatever um, you know pathology is in front of them or um, the you know the clinical outcome that's in front of them. And what we do is we create the reality. It's called moulage. And so this is just a picture of an amputated arm that was blown off by a um, improvised uh, uh, bomb. And so we, uh, the learning teams applied that tourniquet to stop the bleeding. If you were to look at the floor, you'll see an immense pool of blood on the floor before they applied that tourniquet. And when they apply that tourniquet correctly, the bleeding will hence stop. And so after that, then we debrief it. We debrief their, their decision-making. Who did they pull in to make that bleed stop? How did they communicate effectively? Um, and that's really where um, simulation learning um, takes place is in debriefing. And then, like I mentioned, uh, this is a pulmonary critical care physician um, at Health Partners and Regents Hospital. He's using the Microsoft HoloLens. And what we're doing is um, projecting holographic images um, in front of that HoloLens uh, that is uh, recreating a, an image um, in front of that clinician. And this area is growing immensely as the entire world embraces uh, the, the swath and tsunami of, of technology. So we're really in a cool space um, to, to look at how we're gonna uh, get simulation modalities out to the greater masses. So why simulation? Um, many in the public sector don't know the dirty laundry or the hidden data of healthcare. Um, we are in immense crisis right now. Um, we are the third leading, many people do not know this, the third leading cause of death in the United States is uh, patient error, um, bad outcomes. And it's, um, it's a, it's, you know, I think the number is 300,000 to 400,000 people die in the United States due to medical error. We're not communicating effectively. We're not training together. The, the swath of our regula regulatory bodies and the, what we need to, you know, put in front of us every day is, um, I would say, um, it cognitively overloads our teams. And so there's so much new coming at us at once. Um, that we are unable to keep up. And so, and the other piece of that is that we have not trained effectively for decades. We've really perpetuated the, the apprenticeship model in medicine, see one, do one, teach one, go. 
And what we were doing through that is that we were practicing on human beings. We literally didn't have this space of simulation where we came in, we rehearsed together, we failed together, we learned from each other, we debriefed together. Um, we were all in silos and we all, as a, as a practicing nurse, when I came out uh, 21 years ago, the first time I started an IV was on a human being. I was practicing on humans. And so what simulation does is it brings us back, it reels us back and to think differently. And this is where we need the immense voice from the public sector across industry that we've got to change and we've got to do things differently. The other element of simulation, and there's many, many others, I just put three bullets in front of us um, that, um, that were notable in my brain and across industry is the tsunami of departures from healthcare. That happened before COVID and it was accelerated uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. The people in hospitals today are very new. Um, the, the preceptors and the wisdom and knowledge in many of the sectors have left they left healthcare. And so um, the, the preceptors of today um, are, are brand new themselves. They, you know, uh, was out on one of the clinical units. I asked a preceptor recently, how long have you been a nurse? Well, I've been a nurse a year and a half and I'm teaching the new people coming out of academics. I haven't even been a, a nurse for five years. Like what, when I was a nurse, it took five years to be a preceptor. And so that tsunami of departures has placed us in this huge area of vulnerability. Um, what we are doing, and we'll get further into that, of, of making a fierce effort into, um, into mentoring people into the healthcare industry using clinical simulation. To equate to the 300 to 400,000 people that you die in the United States, it's like three Boeing 747s crashing in the United States daily. That's how many people die due to medical error. And simulation is just one piece of it. Um, and I would say it's a large piece of it. Training and education um, has been an area that hasn't had a lot of uh, money funding in healthcare. Um, and I'll just say shame on us, shame on the collective. Uh, for not pressing forward. Um, and the aviation industry has proven that. Now, I will say I'm not sure about Boeing lately, but um, they've proven that if you simulate more, you're going to have less crashes. And that happened in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when there were all of these crashes in the airline industry. So we know that things can be changed, uh, but we know it takes multi-modalities to come around that um, uh, around that uh, vision um, uh, for the future. The other piecewise simulation, we are have the worst maternal disparities in the world in the United States, particularly with Black African American women. We're terrible, and we are the richest uh, country in the world. And we have all of this wisdom and knowledge. And so we have immense work to do to change that trajectory um, for Black African American women in the United States. And to talk a little more about uh, simulation, you know, we know that simulation is an effective tool. Aviation has, has proven that, NASA has proven that, nuclear power, the military have all been do using simulation for decades and decades. Um, that's why we need to find a way to get all of me uh, medicine to be doing simulation because we know it's an effective tool. If you think about where the airline industry was, you know, even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, compared to now, it, we're in a very safe uh, industry when we fly. Uh, you may have heard about a plane that landed in the Hudson River back in 2009 by a pilot uh, named Sully. He attributes his uh, experience with that water landing because of all the simulation training and his fast years of, of flying um, for that safe landing and getting everybody with uh, almost no injuries. So, so we know it's an effective tool. Thanks, Hans. Now transitioning into the impact, and I'm grateful and honored to be to lead an incredible team, and those that were behind me that started Simulation at Health Partners. Um, we are a growing entity. We are, and our leaders here at Health Partners believe in simulation, but 
what we need to do is continue to democratize so the impact is even far greater. Um, within our simulation program, we train about 10,000 people annually here at Health Partners and Park Nicollet, the collective of our organization. And we also are in the community um, where we've got partnerships uh, with uh, local nonprofit uh, communities uh, or businesses that are carrying out healthcare um, in addition to what we service here. Uh, so we're not only servicing health partners, we're also a service and tool for the community um, that we can continue to that um, greater collective impact both in the community and across our organization. We have immense strong uh, departmental and community relationships, um, and that's been proven by the team that was behind me. Um, and now as we chart the future, um, those strong community and departmental relationships um, continue to mature. I'm a convener, um, an innate convener. I know that we can come around these challenges and look across industry to expose what is going on with healthcare um, based on strong, trusted relationships. Um, and uh, I, I think our team absolutely loves um, those trusted relationships that we have. Don and I say many, many times on a weekly basis or a daily basis, there's something here amongst our team that is really, really special. And I will say I've led multiple teams in very dynamic environments. This team here at Health Partner Simulation is probably one of the most dynamic and dedicated that I've ever seen in my entire career. So there's something special uh, with the people that come in um, to this space. Um, and uh, we have really an, 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 an innate ability to continue on with that, um, that future. I will say, if you, if any of you that are on this call that um, use health partners, either in care delivery or hospitals, um, or our primary care um, environments or our dental clinics, we are literally everywhere. Uh, we our ambitious ambulatory care um, initiative this year um, places us in every single ambulatory care primary care health clinic throughout our system, and it also encompasses our 25 dental clinics. So um, we are literally everywhere in care delivery, and I'm proud that the team has embraced this ambitious um, goal this year um, to continue on um, in our in our efforts. What we need from the collective is the support, and we know that um, healthcare has tight margins. The way that we're supported federally and from the state level is slim, and um, we need the greater collective to come behind that uh, to help us out, um, either for, through philanthropic uh, don and fundraising donations, um, but hence, um, our fierce advocacy um, with our, our greater collective, our foundations across health partners, and just want to embed uh, the, the graciousness and generosity that those foundations have been behind us to support um, the greater need. Really quickly, um, where did where did we start? Um, we started at the uh, in the base of Metro State University. Um, and that embedded uh, a, a fundamental relationship with academia. And we still have that partnership today with Metro State University, where those students come into the hospital in their nursing program and their dental therapy program. And we provide um, immersive simulation environments to those students. So, um, and they're so central to the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, through Metro State's vision um, and mission. Uh, that aligns very well to us. And so uh, that's where it started. Uh, the founding director was Gail Johnson, and she did an incredible job uh, to democratize simulation at a very, very early stage um, as healthcare simulation grew. After Metro State University, it went to our corporate office at Health Partners, and that's where we uh, built our mobile program. So we are able to um, take simulation everywhere with our mobile program. Um, it's not just our brick and mortar simulation centers at Regions and Hospital and Methodist Hospital. We carry, like I mentioned, simulation to all of our primary care areas where we're in the environments um, providing that simulation, um, that simulation footprint. After Health Partners Corporate, it then uh, embedded at Regions Hospital and the old 
medical intensive care unit. And we just closed that unit up uh, to open up more bed space at Regents Hospital to accommodate patients and care. And we just built a $5.1 million new uh, simulation center here at Regents Hospital um, inside the hospital for the people. Again, to convene interprofessional teams uh, when they um, can come into the clinical space and use our facility. $4.8 million of that, uh, that capital was uh, the gracious donations and support of the Regents Hospital Foundation and the benefactors. So as we know, um, this impact is great uh, with uh, the generous donations of philanthropy. We also have a Park Nicollet uh, Simulation Center, about 5,500 square feet. And we now have uh, geographically zoned a team um, at Health Partners uh, Park Nicollet uh, Sim Center that is going to, they're already creating this immersive um, and uh, also I would just say culture where we are gonna wanna broaden our capacity at Park Nicollet um, on the west side of the Twin Cities. And so it, it will be, it already is a growing trajectory um, and we're excited to continue that growth um, in the years to come. And then finally, uh, we sit under the Health Partners Institute um, simulation does. So we're a system wide service throughout Health Partners um, and we um, focus with that system to strategy that the Health Partners, um, our Health Partners uh, uh, culture is embracing. Uh, so we leverage research and education throughout the Health Partners Institute, the two main portfolios out of the Institute. Hans, any mentionables that you want or Don, I'll stop there. I have a couple, but I'll let Don go first. I would add that stepping into this position was uh, quite challenging because we had, um, I was very familiar with the region's platform, fairly familiar with the uh, the outliers of the um, uh, critical access hospitals because I was out in the valley for five years as an educator in the simulation out there and clinically. But the West was uh, a little foreign to me, Methodist and, and Hutchinson and Olivia. But I quickly learned that Although we had a SIM center there, it just wasn't utilized to the capacity that we know that it could. And they have a they have a very aggressive and very stable education platform over there. But they weren't utilizing the simulation, um, mostly the personnel to the, the, the fullest extent possible. So I, I came back to the team. I'm like, we've got to get people over there, embedded over there. And we support, we had historically supported the personnel and, and the, the teams at Methodist out of regions. And it quickly became evident as we hired, and I consider them two, two of my best hires and my favorite hires uh, recently, uh, but Jamie and Dan stepped in there and that platform just, just it just blew up and it's gonna continue. Um, so Dan is the, the operations technician over there in simulation, and then Jamie is the uh, education specialist. And while Jamie is out on maternity leave, bless her, uh, things are going to continue to grow as she uh, she stepped out for a couple of months. It's absolutely amazing the support that we've gotten from all aspects of the leadership, the education team there, because they know what we can do and we continue as, as we're talking here to the team. Um, we want to continue to exploit every possible avenue we can to offer simulation services and again as ryan said from the from the beginning of this it's about patient outcomes it's about patient safety and i think we're still in a, in a novice state um on the west side and as we continue to discover uh, more and more opportunities we're going to make sure that we can fill those in so that's my perspective on that time to you hans yeah and just i i absolutely agree with don you know um we obviously work in a very fun and exciting environment here so it's a joy for us to to come to work every day for multiple reasons but i think for me it's the fact that we're influencing a larger number of people to better um outcomes for patients you know so uh you know ryan has uh you know has talked about we work with metro state university we also partner with multiple different um hospital systems in the midwest essential health hcmc 
um, uh, Alina uh, to uh, to help their uh, sim centers grow as well. So in any way we can do it because we're we want to make sure anything that we learn that we share and and uh, help other sim centers um, with their uh, patient outcomes. So. Thanks for that, Hans. Yeah. Thanks, Very Hans. Um, they were getting some yeah. questions. I think. Yeah, I'll I'll keep going here just a little bit, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, you know, the future is is uh, it's bright. It's bright with technology. We're 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 learning as um, a simulation, um, you know, community um, as technology um, immerses. We know that we'll you know we're we've kind of been seen as the technology hub in simulation many people are like well you guys have the mannequins and they're blinking and they're breathing and they're doing all these like really cool things and uh, many people in the healthcare industry of like oh simulation like you kind of embrace that early on and um and so a lot of people are looking as as to us about what what is simulation doing with the future of artificial intelligence and how are we going to leverage ai um to we know that we're going to have a, a workforce where we won't have enough human beings uh, to carry out healthcare um, in the future. And so, how do we leverage off of technology to carry out healthcare of the future? So um, we're we're in that we're in that failure mode. We're in the trying mode, and uh, we want to get teams of people around technology to see what it can take off the human brain because the human brain is cognitively overloaded in healthcare. There's so many inputs that we can't keep up. And so the human being, what can they do the best? They can provide empathy and compassion and sit down with patients and listen to patients. Um, but what is the other you know, mechanics behind that AI can help us? So um, these photos are of our simulation space, um, virtual reality. We've got um, simulators that are working with robotics with our surgeons and our, our students of the future. Um, the upper right corner is a student um, that we're partnering with a local high school. She's learning, she's wanting to be an ultrasonographer. And so she's able to come into our simulation space and use uh, 3D, um, 3D technology to look inside the chest of a human. Um, and to see the different um, anomalies that are in that um, in that uh, that mannequin. Um, I'll put Hans on and Don. Anything you want to talk about um, in the future um, in technology? I would I would love to continue that because we you know it's very exciting. But Ryan, I really want to um, emphasize we've got nine minutes left, and we definitely want to offer that some time to answer some questions from the. Yeah, I know we've got some slides left, but I really, really want to hear some questions, and I'm sure we can dig up some more content out of that. Yes, please. Abby, Ivy, take it away for questions. You have got it. Okay, so one of the first questions we have here is how does philanthropy play a role in the simulation efforts at Health Partners? What does it provide and what could you do? Wish list in parentheses with more funds. Like what if you if you had a wish list of things that we philanthropy could help with, um, can you speak on that? Yes. Um, I'll 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 start and then Don and Hans. Number one to create the democratization to get this in every nook and cranny. It's no longer a nice to have in a nice sexy great cool place with all these simulators. It's a must have, just like the fire alarm system, just like the oxygen. And so to create the space, number one, we need space to for our mission to democratize sim. Number two, we need the people. So, um, you know, so much of the time that, you know, you know, from a capital perspective and foundations really are super helpful in getting the capital, the space, the building, the mannequins. But what is more important now than ever is the team. It's the team of simulationists that that um, do the work every single day um, that make impact. And so it's, I would say, both the space, but more importantly, like the people. So, um, for example, we haven't landed on a medical director for healthcare simulation here at Health Partners yet. Other bigger simulation programs throughout the world and country have. And so that is just another layer of how we could use another tool 
um, to carry more impact with our providers, um, our physicians, our surgeons, um, or other uh, providers throughout um, throughout healthcare. So, um, and we also need the people to figure out figure it out. We need to in, we need to invoke and bring the people, the learners, in to have this wisdom and knowledge of what we need to do in the future to make us safer. So, um, so I say the people and the space. Are are ultimately the the biggies. Don Hans, I would agree with that. I completely concur with that. But if you're asking for specifics, you know we're already talking about we we love to have a new sim center over on the on the west side, you know the Methodist campus somewhere in there. That's going to take people and effort. Um, even now, I know that I'm looking for the end of the year. I'm going to need more personnel resources based on the request of simulation at, at Methodist and 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 the greater system. It's there's not a day that goes by or maybe a couple of days that go by. We're not getting requests uh, for the added simulations. The platform is just continuous to grow um, as we spread into, you know, just the micro of what simulation can offer. So that's it's, that's the biggest piece with people and space. I absolutely agree with Don. You know, it, it is people in space and I think that's our only barrier right now we have a very uh, ample amount of equipment we have about 34 different simulation mannequins ranging from uh, you know male female uh, newborn one-year-old five-year-old adult um, and just um, with just the staff in the space now so I, I agree with Don and Ryan both that we should be in every single hospital every single day doing training with everybody that comes uh, through the doors so um, yeah so that's our only barrier is just people uh, staff, so getting more staff on board. And we've been asking and we've been getting. We, we, I, since I've been in this position, I've been here about, I mean, two years at, at Health Party Simulation Platform and about eight months in this operations manager position. Everything we've asked for, we've gotten. We, we, su we supply the, you know, the SBAR, show the, the, you know, the impact of the outcomes, and we just continue to um, impact the system with that. So, there's a there's a tremendous amount of thank you to the system and understanding and appreciating that. So absolutely, I absolutely agree with Don. I think the health partners as an organization is very supportive of simulation training. So and, and always have been. One more piece that I'll add, thanks, Hans and Don, is that from a philanthropy perspective, we also need to make time uh, that we're supporting our clinicians with education because our senior executives have that tight margin. And education always tends to get cut because it's not supported. It's not, they don't have the funding, they don't have the money. And um, what's what's glaringly obvious is that if you cut education and training, you will have poorer outcomes. It, it's, it's studied, it's researched, it's proven. So we have to support our CNOs and our VPMAs and their executives that we need to front load education. It needs to be supported. Um, we need to shake it up. We might need to do training differently. We might need to shift our assets um, that we're doing in the e-learning quadrant and bring it more into simulation. And that'll take, you know, a shakeup. But we're really, really on the cusp of where I feel in healthcare that we need to do things differently. We have to. And so, um, so I would add that as as another piece. So our our because they want it, but they can't get it because they don't have funding. So, um, so that comes down to a shared strategy um, and how we come together and align together. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Other questions, Abby? Yes, we do have another one here. Um, how does the Sim Center measure impact? Fantastic question. Yes, so um, I, I will uh, I will share the screen right here and I'll tell a story. Um, Don can uh, can go on further. Um, the 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 photo off to the right. The photo off to the right is at Hudson Hospital in the emergency department. Those beautiful teammates and Don did uh, what's called the first five minutes of a cardiac arrest simulation. A week or two later. There was the same that same team um, was attending to a visitor who came to visit his wife. The visitor had a cardiac arrest in front of his wife in the emergency department. That team attests Don's training with simulation in experiential debriefing to the saved outcome 
of that human being. That's impact. That's one life saved through simulation. Very similar outcome out of Hutchinson Hospital of a pilot. Um, the train, the team trained two or weeks prior. They did it over and over. They failed. They corrected. The pilot came into um, the emergency department. He's since died um, at, at a level one trauma center in the Twin Cities. But his life was saved eventually or, or extended for the family to say goodbye. And they attest that that training allowed him to extend his life for the family to say goodbye. And people that were in that training said it's because of simulation. That's impact. The photo on the left is impact that we've made within uh, our LGBTQ plus community, our racial disparities and our racism that is uh, going on in the United States and globally. That's Sumaya Noor. We created a simulation at Health Partners in diversity, equity, and anti-racism in our human simulation quadrant, where we replicate racism at the bedside. We work through that. We promote allyship and coming around our colleagues Sumaya will attest that how we've embraced that in health partners and simulation has made meaningful impact in the Somali community and the Black African American community and the LGBTQ plus community. That's impact. One further, the global community has made impact on a central line or associated bloodstream infections, infections that happen in the hospital. The more that you have a simulation portfolio and program that's democratized, there's redu reduction of infections in hospitals uh, for patients. So the more that we do it in SIM, there's proven outcomes, measurable outcomes that we reduce hospitalized infections in ho that are acquired in hospitals. That's impact. Those are two, three small stories, maybe not small, large stories of impact of simulation. I'm at a loss for words, to be honest with you. I think that it's you touched upon the impact from a DEI perspective, from a quality of care and um, outcomes perspective, but also the emotional component, like you've been saying. So thank you so much for telling us about those examples. And it looks like we do have a few more questions. I don't know how long you can stay on. Um, We're able to stay on. Oh, good. Perfect, because it's been a wonderful presentation. Um, another question we have here is how do you work with the Women's Center and Birth Center to improve maternal health disparities? Don, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's a great, uh, yeah, great question. So we have a wonderful um, simulation educator, uh, Lori Winters, um, first and foremost, working out of the simulation center with the Methodist platform in a program called Empower. And that program dedicated to, you know, social disparities, um, clinical disparities with maternal health and embedded in that. And they're having great success. So we do this repetitive sims. We bring in um, actually seasoned and over experienced um, standardized patients. And I say seasoned, um, they have history themselves. And so they bring their personal experiences to the bedside and and share with the team through those simulations those experiences and it doesn't get any more real than that and furthermore here at regions we've, we've had our challenges um and we're we're currently in the process of bringing on an ob um, expert clinician educator into the sem center to help bridge uh some of the communication processes uh, understanding the, the quality and the safety components of that. And I anticipate this individual will go system wide um, and to leverage her expertise to be able to bridge across the full spectrum and offer insight and bedside clinical simulation. And so I'm really excited about that. That's kind of a new effort that we have, but I think it's important to have those relationships and communication between all of our hospitals and then the greater community at large. So we're going to continue the efforts that we have at Methodist, but I think we're going to grow um, in a new sphere uh, moving forward to support that. One Great additional time. comment I'll make too is um, 
we know that the it's proven it's been done in the nordic countries across the globe that the more sequential and frequent you train with simulation lives are saved it's been proven effective shared at the international simulation conference in san diego california this year um the maternal disparities of postpartum hemorrhage seizures shoulder dystocia all of those we have simulators that can simulate all of that, and we do that training um, across our health system. You know, as we're regulated in healthcare, the Joint Commission has placed that that's a non-negotiable, um, throwing everything at the table um, at this maternal disparities issue that we have. Um, what's missing is the frequency. Again, we're not funded for that frequency. Units aren't funded. So we come in once a year and do the maternal, dis, you know, maternal disparities or hemorrhage simulation. Then we leave. That's a small sliver of the team that had that simulation education. So we need to look at more um, our our strategy for frequent succession of simulation to get in front of it. And that's been proven by our partners um, and our humans across the global the community, particularly in the UK, particularly in the Nordic countries. So again, shame on us in the USA. We we've got problems and we need to speak from the mountaintops about those problems and expose those. So again, funding for more training and education, and the frequency of the training will have lives saved. It's proven. So let's work collectively together on a shared mission and, and vision. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Let me just make sure that there aren't any questions in the chat here. Let me see. Um, no, but lots and lots of accolades, but I do have a quick question for you as a follow-up. Um, with, for example, you were mentioning different patients coming and providing um, their own personal experiences and stuff like that to help inform the simulation. How do you get in touch with these patients or how do you um, make that connection in order to inform the simulations? Don, do you want to take that or you want me yeah, to? That's a good question because I think there's a variety of avenues that we do that. You know, so when you talk about patients, we got, you know, we're concerned about patient confidentiality and those types of things. But um, I know that the, the specific patient that we that we the event that we talked about at Hudson, um, I leveraged the team that took care of the the patient and I, and the provider that was there, and and their response was, you know, I think that we need to leave that alone. I think we don't want to pull them into this, um, and just to respect the the the, the severity of, of the the care process for them. We've had other patients that come back or other people that we've trained. That they come back and they want to um, attest to what we've done and how we've done it and the impacts of simulation education and then the greater good of you know what our healthcare system offers. So there there is a variety of, of inputs to that. Um, you know we try to highlight those successes in, in many aspects. Um, I know Ryan can talk about the you know the, the lost pilot out in Hutchinson we met specifically, but. Yeah, Ryan, why don't you talk about that? Because that's that's a really um, a, it's kind of a linear processing question. Yeah, I think it's multifactorial. It's really the team that comes back to say that this is where the vast impact was. We get that throughout multiple channels of communication back to us. We promote that like in our, our simulation, we, we pre-brief and debrief that that impact is shared so we can we can share it on a, you know, a broader a broader landscape. Um, many of it's just through our through our social connections, through our trusted relationships that we've built across the organization. Um, you know, all of us that have been in emergency medicine, many of us have been. Um, that's just a, a huge, vast social network um, in itself. And so uh, we've been in the industry a long time. A lot of people know our, you know, know us and know how to feed us um, information um, that does provide that that human impact of, uh, of a lie saved. Um, you know, the other piece is, uh, you know, our partners um, that provide all these beautiful simulators. You know, one of our um, our partners is Laird Medical out of uh, Stavanger, Norway. 
they're on a mission with uh, their company to save 1 million lives by 2030, one life at a time. And so they've collected and collated many, 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 many lives saved um, through simulation. And one of those lives saved was actually out of uh, Westfield's hospital of a woman who was hemorrhaging in an OB emergency. And that manager reached out to that patient to ask if we could share her story with Lairdall Medical. And so it's our relation um, in our human networks that um, create those, those you know, platforms or ability for people to feed us information. Let me, let me add to that, if I may. That connection going back is, is a healing component for us as clinicians. When I was at bedside for years and years and years, I, I was in a trauma center. I was a critical care ICU flight nurse. I didn't get the results of the patient. I didn't know what their outcomes were many times. And I'd often wonder. And it was just part, it was part of the nature of the job. But to have these stories come back and just, you know, having and, and, the, and the good stuff, the saves, the, the accolades or the thank yous, it's really important for us as clinicians to hear that and understand that and, and, and because it's healing. We're very aggressive in this platform, Ryan I, Hans, and our team about closing those loops on those stories because it, it's got to come full circle. And if it doesn't, there's always, to me, in my, in my mind, in my heart, there's a hole there that I wonder why. I wonder what happened to that. And so we're dedicated to highlighting every single full circle component of what we do and how we do it in healthcare. And that might be a personal perspective from me, but um, I don't think it is. I think a lot of us share those, that, those same feelings. So just wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much. And I know we have at least one more question, but would it be okay, you guys, if I, I receive more questions and stuff like that um, offline that I forward them your way so they get it answered? Okay, perfect. Absolutely, yeah. So, okay, well, let me read that one last question I saw here. One second, okay. Let me see, I thought I saw one. Here we go. Um, from hearing you speak today, it's clear Health Partners has embraced the importance of simulation. Would you consider Health Partners to be on the cutting edge and more advanced than healthcare systems nationwide, or where do we rank, so to speak? We're number yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you> go. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, good. Yeah, like I'll, I'll support Don 100% there. We're number one. I think, it, like I mentioned, the people that we have here is something very, very special. Yes. Um, there's simulation programs that take a simulation off the shelf and just put it in front of the learners and, you know, kind of keep going. We tailor so much of our simulation to meet the people where they're at. And so we pride ourselves on that um, and uh, we work really hard at it. And so um, so I think we are um, we are a, a huge at the top ranking of that. Um, we are the biggest um, care delivery simulation center in Minnesota that encompasses our care delivery sites, our hospitals, our clinics, our dental clinics. No one comes close to us in there. Um, other simulation centers around us, uh, such as the University of Minnesota, they're really focused on their academic programs, the medical school, the dental school, all those, which, which is very, very, very important. Um, we are the biggest in, in care delivery um, in, in Minnesota. Uh, Mayo, large uh, sim system, um, again, they're primarily focused in their medical school and their other, they, they have a large footprint of nursing education, of course, too, um, and also in innovation. Um, but um, we are the biggest and largest that have the biggest swath over care delivery in our hospitals and our clinics. An area that we need to embrace and get further on is what I would say will drive us to the future is immersive design. Using simulation to design the future of healthcare. Um, fantastic work at Boston Children's through Dr. Peter Weinstock, who is a critical care physician, a surgeon, then, and then has turned as a simulationist or a simulation physician. He's using immersive design with simulation to create the future, to become safer, to bring people um, into this space to co-create um, and doing some radically cool things um, out in Boston Children's. We can create it here. 
we've got we've got the right people. We've got uh, the support collectively through health partners, and we've got an incredible team that wants to do more for a main mission, and that's to save people's lives. And so um, there are bigger systems out there, of course, um, but I think uh, we pride ourselves in something very special happening here that uh, maybe a lot of centers don't have. Yeah, and we were actually the first simulation center in the Midwest uh, back in 2004. We were the first simulation center in the Midwest to be accredited by the Simulation Society in Healthcare um, to say that we meet all of the standards to do the best education in simulation. So, like like Ryan had mentioned, you know, um, uh, you know, some sim some locations are just grabbing uh, sim, uh, you know, off the shelf, and we are designing our own simulations, partnering with our uh, different nursing faculty um, to create those simulations, customized to tailor for their needs. So. Yeah, I would I would back that up. There's two, two important pieces, and I actually wrote them down. So we meet what what we need to. We're embedded with quality and safety, and then we work with the learners through the educators to meet their needs. And then we put we wrap that around with a very strong psychologically safe platform um, with its tenants to make sure that our team members are walking away going, I want to come back and do more simulation because I was able to go in there in that brave space and perform, fail, fail forward, and come out of that and take those clinical or those experiences back to the bedside and then use them. One more notable before we close, Abby, the, the pictures that you see on the screen, the smiles from the staff, that is huge. We are in a huge uh, swath of burnout in healthcare. Some of my most favorite days in simulation is when I go through the centers, I see people's smiles, I hear laughter, I see people working together for a greater good across our professions. That is impact. That is success. They will keep coming back if we infuse joy and purpose and collective wisdom that simulation brings. And I don't think there might be other programs out there that do it as well as we do. Um, and so those are the best days of simulation. It's the people. It's the people that come back to this work every day that we need to feed and protect and do what they need. And so and that comes across uh, by our quantitative data from our learners. More simulation. Thank you for a safe, brave space. I needed this. I find joy in this work. So that's impact. Oh my goodness, you are all so excellent. And thank you so much for the amazing work that you do and for informing us all. I personally could be coming up with questions and asking you all day about the amazing work that you guys do because it touches upon the personal component of healthcare, the quality of care, and so many other um, avenues and population health. So thank you so much for your time. Again, thank you everybody for um, coming and hearing these awesome experts to chat about the simulation center and the amazing work they do. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, I will make sure to forward them Ryan, Hans, and Don's way after the presentation. So thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you all. Have a great week. You too. Bye-bye.